Uh, before I begin uh, another segment, uh, I would like to um, give an apology to uh, Bill Odom and Albano De Silva. Because earlier when we started our first segment, I forgot to mention uh, Bill Odom and, and, and Albano because I forgot to put them on my list. You know, when you get older, you for, sometimes you forget some things. So, so those two were also under the uh, umbrella of the uh, Roberts uh, karate tree. And Bill Odom is down at Norfolk, Virginia, and Albano is up at uh, the coast of uh, Maryland. Uh, I want to go back to some more, uh, more again of my childhood because there were a lot of things I missed uh, talking about uh, at my childhood days. You know, when I grew up, uh, for one thing, we never went to the doctor. I never went to the doctor. Uh, my mother always treated us with the Hawaiian uh, medicines from the, from, the, from the forest and from the woods. Uh, she used herbs. You know, I had the typical me uh, measles, mumps, uh, chicken pox, and th those things, and everything was taken care of at home. So I just want to emphasize the fact that while growing up, I never did go to the hospital. I went to the hospital, really, but I'll take that back. I went to the hospital twice before I went into the army. Once uh, I was playing football at uh, when I was in the kindergarten, and the guy was I was running with the ball. The guy tackled me from the back, and my face hit this big chunk of rock that was embedded in the ground, and my my mouth and everything hit the uh, hit the rock and tore my whole mouth up. I ended up in the, of course going to the dentist. That was one of the times that I ended up in the hospital. And then the second time is I was probably, oh, maybe eight or nine. I forgot how old I was. I was uh, climbing this mango tree in our yard. We had a huge mango tree. It was about as tall as a, tall as a telephone pole. And there was a nice, nice yellow ones up top. So I started climbing the tree. And I sat, I was squatting on a branch and reach, reaching out for this nice, yellow mango and the next thing I remember is the branch I was squatting on broke and the last thing I remember is falling backwards when I woke up I was in the hospital and those were the only two times I ended up going to the hospital when I was a kid uh, and the next time I remember going to the hospital is when I joined the army went, went for my physical I just wanted to emphasize the fact that we took care of all of our sicknesses at home, I, my mom took care of that. In Hawaii, we call that lao la pa'au. It's a person who knows how to use the herbs from the, from, the, from the woods, and she was a master at that. Also, while growing up, um, there was a time, I remember talking about Christmas. I remember there was a time one year, we were so poor at one time that we had to make our own Christmas tree. And there was another tree in our yard it was, uh, I don't know what the, what kind of tree it was. It had branches and it had a lot of leaves. And all the leaves were little leaves, not real little, but maybe about the size of a quarter. But they were all different colors, red, maroon, orange, and it looked very colorful. So that year we didn't have any money to, for the family to buy a Christmas tree. So my mom told me to, you know, climb the tree and start cutting off these branches. And I'd cut off these branches and uh, what she'd do is take a, a twine and, and wire it together and make it look like a Christmas tree and it was very beautiful. We didn't even need any lights, but we did put lights on it because we did have a string of lights. And we put it on that uh, made up Christmas tree and it looked really good. And that was another thing I forgot to mention. Uh, when I was a kid growing up in a neighborhood, we were uh, so poor that time that we couldn't afford a tree, so we had to make one. You know, you just do it the best you can. Also, there was uh, between uh, kindergarten and elementary school, I learned, I learned a lot. 
you know, during those years of the war, all the men were gone. So a lot of the boy, a lot of the, the kids, or everybody had to chip in and to do whatever needs to do, whatever you need to do. But do, during those years, I learned how to cook. I learned how to wash clothes. I learned how to starch. I learned how to iron. I learned how to make poi out of taro. Uh, I learned how to sew. Uh, I, I, we learned everything. I learned everything uh, that a young young boy could learn, and that that helped me as an adult also. You know, when you look back, you say, "Wow, you know, a kid that knows all of oh, we had to in those in those years we had to so that we can help everybody, support each the whole family because the men were gone." Uh, in fact, on our back porch, we had a, a huge, um, what we call Papakuriai, was is a platform where we we pound the poi, which is called a pa'iai, where we made our own poi out of taro. And I, I learned how to do that as a kid, as a young youngster. So by the time I graduated from elementary school, I was a young man, boy, but I still was a young boy. And I, I learned all of that. And plus the war was going on. Also, I remember mentioning it to you that I had an ID card that I had to carry around. Well, I went back and I found it. And this is the front portion of it. This is where your name and address is printed up front. And in the back, in the back here is where your fingerprints are printed and the dates that you issued your gas mask and the date you were giving your shots. And on this, I was issued my mask on March 31st, 1942. That's when they issued me my gas mask. And those the gas masks we had to carry it, carry it uh, wherever we went. And anyway, but this is the ID card that we have. That's a pretty uh, important document. And uh, I don't know how, and heck, I still have that thing that was that was given to me in 1942 when I was, I think, eight years old, and I still have it. In fact, I was uh, I learned how to iron so good that even now I still iron my my dress shirts for me, my white dress shirts. And even Terry at times would tell me to, if, if she needs anything, her blouses to iron, I would iron her blouses for her. Uh, I still do that uh, as of now. Okay, back to going, going to the Korean War. Uh, we were all replacements and they wanted us there as quickly as possible, so all of us uh, went over on on the uh, flights. We flew over. We didn't we didn't go over on a ship or anything. They wanted us there quick, so we all split up in different number of groups, number wise, and flew over to uh, Japan. Um, sometimes there were ten. Sometimes there were three. I think on mine, I was the only one. And the type of plane I was on was a C-47 cargo plane. It had uh, a twin engine. I was kind of leery of that thing flying all the way across the Pacific Ocean. But anyway, this is a picture of myself. And as you can see, I have my rifle with me. In those days, we carried our rifle with us. Uh, whenever we left the post, we checked it in at, at the base. But uh, you carried your rifle with you, right on the plane and everything. Uh, and that's my uniform. That's what I went to Korea with. Yes, By the way, that... Uh, you know, uh, all of our training here is all with summer clothes. So that was my, supposedly to be my winter clothes. And as you can see, that's not really that, as you can see, it's not really not that warm. It would keep me warm there while I'm in Korea. But anyway, boarded the plane. <clears throat> I said goodbye to my girlfriend and all that. Left and we had to make up the subs. So I think Johnson Island was one. I believe Wake was the other one before we landed in Japan. Uh, and uh, this, car, this cargo plane uh, was a C-47. And when we landed, when we took our approach on Johnson Island, you know, Johnson Island is a pretty narrow island. 
we kind of almost missed it. We had to take another run at it before we could land. And when we landed, all we had to do was refuel and just kept going. And then finally we um, ended up in Japan, bought it, bought it trucks and headed for uh, Camp Drake, uh, where the seventh camp, where the uh, first cab division was headquartered at before they left to go to Korea. So that Camp Drake was kind of a, like a replacement, uh, replacement post where all the replacements came in. From there you went to Korea or vice versa. You come there and go back to the mainland. We met, all up, we met up again with all the, all the local guys until we all got there. And then we all were uh, on our way to uh, Korea again, getting on a plane and flying over to, uh, I believe it was, I think it was Kimpo Air Base, I'm not sure. But they wanted us there fast because of the, uh, it was a big push heading north. And we had the enemy on the run, I guess. Anyway, we landed at uh, Kimpo, which is somewhere near Seoul. And they took us to this big train station. And there were these huge cattle cars, you know, where they're all cattle. And it smelled like they had cattle in there too. And they just piled us in there like cattle. And we were piled up and uh, when it was, when the cattle car was full, they put another one in there. And then we'd load up the train and that train was heading north to North Korea. On our way up to North uh, Korea, all of a sudden we were, the train stopped and we were in a tunnel. And the guys who were in the, in the cattle car that was stuck in the tunnel, we thought we were ambushed already because we didn't know what was going on. But come to find out there was something that stopped the train from moving forward. And then, you got, and then later on, it kept on going. I don't know how long it took us to get to, uh, uh, to North Korea. I think we got to Pyongyang, which is the northern capital of Korea. And then again, uh, there was another breakdown of, of, of troops. And then the units from uh, that were fighting up there came to these to this replacement company to pick up replacements. So this uh, squad leader came down the line, and, and there were ten of us from Hawaii that was chosen to go to this uh, recon company. So we were called to go to the uh, 25th Division, 25th Infantry Recon Company. So here comes the squad leader. He was a rifle squad leader, and walking down the line. Uh, choosing the people he wants and then all of a sudden he points in my direction and he says uh, you're going to be my machine gunner and I thought he was pointing next to the guy who makes, next to me which was a big holly guy you know he would be a nice machine gunner and the guy and my squad he said no you and he pointed at me and I said I'm going to be a gunner he said yep oh, so I know I'm going to die now because machine gunners don't last long in combat uh, you know that's the first person they go after the machine guns so I was, the, the reason for that, we lost the machine gunner before me. So I said, oh my God. So anyway, that was the, the start of our company. I was assigned the 1st Platoon, uh, Rifle Squad, 25th Recon Company. And we headed up further north, heading towards the Yellow River. And I think we got uh, pretty, we got pretty close to the Yellow River and we buckled down and set up a, a, a defensive line and all that and started uh, digging in and just pre getting prepared. And then all of us, uh, then, we had, then we had our uh, uh, Thanksgiving dinner. I remember that, having Thanksgiving dinner. And I think a week after that is when all hell broke loose. And that's when the, the Chinese National Army from China entered the war. And we didn't know that about three to 400,000 infiltrated into North Korea and nobody even noticed them until they were there. And once they started their attack, there was no stopping them. They just, they just came and they overpowered everybody. They overran everybody. In fact, uh, we were kind of in an outpost blocking position and they just ran right by us, didn't care about us. They wanted the main line. We were kind of like an isolated uh, platoon. 
they, they wanted the big guys. They wanted the, they wanted the front line, and we were part of. We were we were in the front of the front line. The recon company's job is go find the enemy, and that's what I, that's what their job is. So we're usually being a reconnaissance company. Usually we're five to ten miles, maybe sometimes in the front the front main front line. And our job is, like I said, is to look at the enemy. Well, we had to fight our way back to get back to our own front lines. But that was the beginning. That was the beginning of the end for us, as far as the Chinese, uh, the Chinese uh, attack was. And it didn't take them long to push that whole Eight Army line down to the Han River, north of the Han River. Then when the army, the Eighth Army, got to the Han River, we were designated as blocking for the whole Eighth Army to cross the Han River. And of course, we were on one side of the bridge of the Han River, and we had another platoon on the other side of the bridge, not on the south side of the Han River, but still on the north side, but on the other side of the bridge. You see, in a blocking position too. So I was up in a chapel st uh, steeple, looking with my binoculars and. As soon as I saw the enemy, was to you know let let all people know, and I, I saw them from far out coming. I said they're coming. So once we started blocking for uh, getting everybody finally getting across the Han River, the platoon on our left, which was on the other side of the Han River, they got cut off, and they couldn't make it back. So that was a 33-man platoon right there that was gone. So we made it the last. We were the last people to cross the Han River. And then they blew the Han River up. We moved back south to some place, I think it was called uh, Suwon, I think. Yeah, Suwon. Uh, then I'll pick it up later. Okay, I'm going to go back to talking about, I forgot to talk about how cold it was there in Korea. And as you can see, all the people who left from uh, from Hawaii, we, all we had was summer clothes. We didn't have no winter clothes. So we all went over with khakis. Um, nobody knew what a winter sleeping bag was. Nobody knew what a, any type of winter clothing was. We didn't have any. So it was really cold. In fact, they were saying the, uh, that was the coldest war that America has ever been involved in. Uh, we left Hawaii, it was 80 degrees. When we got to Korea, it was between 50 and 60 below zero. Now, the temperature when we got there was around 30, 35 below zero, but then the wind chill factor from uh, Manchuria brought the uh, temperature down to 50, 60. And everything froze, the weapons, everything. Food, ammo, my weapon frozen. I mean, you had to, sometimes you had to do what you need to make it work, so. It was a very cold and miserable uh, winter. That the Korean winter is, is brutal, especially in North Korea because of the Manchuria, the way the, way the peninsula is made up. You know, that wind just comes right through the north and the north comes right through the northern plain of, in North Korea. And the wind is what kills you. And, and, and if you fall asleep, accidentally fall asleep, you're not going to get up. You're going to die. And there were, I, I think I remember distinctly two times that almost happened to me. And it's it's funny, there's something that wakes you up uh, and, and that it wakes you up. <clears throat> and if you don't get up past that, that time frame there, you're gone. You're, all your, your body is gone. So, but when it, when you do wake up, it's just like being in a freezer. Just like waking up in a freezer, it's so cold. And you know, us being no winter clothes, I mean, we had to scrounge everything we had to try to keep us warm. And we had, our, I had my regular army combat boots that I had from Hawaii. I didn't have no, no snow packs, no, no Mickey Mouse boots, no nothing. Because we didn't have it. But you know, the human body, the human mind, the human will to live is pretty great too. And that's what drives you on, the will to live. Uh, as far as that winter, uh, Christmas, um, 
I remember Christmas Eve, I was called down off the mountain to go to the seat, uh, command post and report, and I reported down there and just told me that you got promoted to PFC, so mm -hmm. it was a big deal, private first class, and so I'll now go back up on the hill. Anyway, Christmas, I don't we were fighting already. Uh, I kind of lost that Christmas. But you know, I, throughout my whole military career, I've had five hardship tours. In other words, five tours that you can't take your family with you. So you can look, just doing that, you can say, well, I missed five Christmases away from home. So uh, I've been away from home a lot, but people <laughs> didn't realize that. But uh, it was a very miserable winter, that uh, 50 winter. And it was so cold that uh, I remember we captured a couple of prisoners, when, but they were in a foxhole, and when we tried to pull them out, they couldn't come out because they both, both of them didn't have lay, uh, feet. It was gone. They both had frostbite, and they wanted us to take it, take them with us. But well, we couldn't do it. We were, we were on the move, and that was, that would slow us down. So all, all I could do to help them a little bit was to pour, take some gasoline from one of our tanks and just pour it on their feet, on their legs, and just kill the gangrene kill the uh, maggots that were on all over their legs and all that, so I hated to leave them, but I mean, hopefully somebody else behind us could have picked them up. And uh, by the way, I was 17 years old. It's, it's a lot of uh, a lot of things that a 17-year-old has to go through, but you know, I, I volunteered for it. But I didn't know what to, I didn't know what to expect, and sometimes we we overload what we really shouldn't do, but we did. And when we, when you do, you just got to do the best you can to survive. Uh, but I didn't know it was going to be that bad. Uh, and uh, I also, there's another thing that uh, earlier in 1949, I joined the National Guard. I lied, uh, I lied to them, went to the, 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 the National Guard. We had an armory downtown Honolulu. I went downstairs, told the guy. I wanted to sign up. I said, how old are you? I said, 17. They said, come on, sign this paper and all that. So I just, I was 16. So I was 16 when I joined the National Guard. And when the Korean War broke out, I was 17. I made 17 in May. The Korean War broke out in June. I joined the Army in July. So thanks for that type of life. But anyway, uh, I enjoyed, I, I, I enjoyed uh, what I did with the military. So I'll, I'll just stop for now and take a break and come back later. Thanks. Um, uh, remember what I mentioned earlier in my uh, segment that I I was chosen to be the machine gun and the guy next to me was a holy guy. I, I just found this picture and I was 17 years old. And as you can see, uh, my body was an ammo barrel and his name was Boyd. So. Uh, and you can see that I don't have too much uh, winter clothes on, but it was pretty cold. Anyway, we just found that picture. Go back, go back on the camera.